So this was a really good conversation with Ian McGilchrist. Ian is a really important thinker because his work is both scientifically rigorous, but also restores a place for the divine. He's the author of the hugely influential book, The Master and His Emissary. And we were talking now just as he had released his new epic, which he spent 10 years writing, called The Matter with Things. And that's what I wish for people, that they will make contact again with the vision of a world that is not a heap of pointless fragments, that is not chaotic, ugly, and without meaning, which is not just um, one in which we are the playthings of chance and embroiled in a war of all against all, but one that is beautiful, intrinsically complex, rich, conscious, and responsive. He explained how he was taking on the argument from the master and his emissary, which looked at how the different brain hemispheres experience the world differently. So we now have, if you like, a way of detecting when we're contrasting two views, which one is more likely to be coming from the left hemisphere and which is more likely to be coming from the right hemisphere. I, I, I can say that categorically. And if that is the case, that is surely a remarkable step forward in the history of philosophy because it means instead of saying, well, some people see it like this and other people see it like that, these appear to be incompatible. And for 2,000 years or more, we just shrug our shoulders and go, well, there are differences of opinion. What we can say now is that we can see where they come from. We can see what their lineage is. We can see what their ancestry is in terms of the brain. And we therefore can tell which one is worthier of our trust and allegiance. We also talked about the difficulties he found when writing about the sacred. As I say, it caused me more grief than anything else I wrote because of two contradictory things, which I think are probably to be expected by anyone who's thought a lot about spiritual matters, that the subject is profoundly important and yet almost impossible to speak about. And that in speaking about it, you, you inevitably betray it, but in not speaking about it, you also betray it because you pretend it doesn't exist and is not important. So I, of course, failed, as one must in this attempt, but I am proud to have tried and failed, and I hope that my attempt and my failure will encourage some people to be less glib in their dismissal of such an idea. In fact, I hope that through the course of the book, people will be led from this, I think, very simple-minded reductionist materialist way of thinking about everything to a view that <clears throat> there is a great deal more here than we can easily comprehend or perhaps ever comprehend, and that it is important to honor that and be aware of it, and that if we do, we help to bring more of something rather good into being. In other words, we carry a kind of moral responsibility for whatever it is that goes on in the, in the cosmos because we are not just in a passive way part of this creative cosmos, have been created, but also we are part of the process of creating what comes. So in a way, far from our lives being pointless and worthless and meaningless, there is if you like, a, a moral weight to our existence, which is to do our best to attend openly and without judgment to what is, to see what is there, to respond to it, and to encourage it more into being. So Ian will be coming to the Rebel Wisdom Digital Campfire for a live Q&A in a couple of weeks' time. So if you want to join that, then consider becoming a Rebel Wisdom member. And I hope you enjoy the film. Ian, welcome back. Thank you very much. Lovely to be here. So we've talked before, and mm -hmm. we're talking now because you've just published your epic mm -hmm. book, The Matter With Things, which I think you've been working on for 10 years. Is that right? That's about right, yeah. How do you feel now that it's finally been published in two volumes? Yes. It's, a, it's a huge work. Um, yeah, how do you, how, what's the emotion now? I, I was thinking, well, what have I done? <laughs> um, there's a mixture of feelings, uh, much less a feeling of relief than there ought to be, because it's been an immense labour, it really has. 
and more sort of curiosity to see how people react, but on the little bit of uh, information I've got so far, that's been, been, been nice to hear. People seem to be responding positively. Yeah, and I find your work compelling. The, your previous book was The Master and His Emissary, that I think many people will be familiar with. And why I find your work particularly compelling, my, my background is in journalism. I've always been very interested in the cultural conversation and feeling like there's often no space for conversations around the divine or spirituality, the sort of hegemony of the new atheists. And your work, as much as anyone's, maybe more than anyone else's, seems to be able to cut through that because you present in a very scientifically rigorous way um, a hypothesis about the way we perceive the world that brings back a space for spirituality, a space for the divine. And I feel like your work, as much as any other work, has the potential to be this kind of crossover, um, a hinge point in terms of a different, potentially kind of introducing more rationalist people to a more, yeah, a more holistic worldview. Um, and maybe we'll just frame it in the sort of the moment that we're at now, where the conversation is before we delve into the book. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that summary? I do, I like that. Uh, the bit that I like particularly is the idea that you don't make it entirely explicit, which is that as far as I'm concerned, many of the oppositions that we've set up are false. So there's an opposition between science and the humanities, or, and particularly perhaps between science and the spiritual. Um, or between, for example, reason and imagination, or between science and intuition. All of these, I think, are profoundly false. And one of the things I see myself as doing in this book is showing how uh, these, these elements in experience and in our uh, capacity for understanding that we think of as so distant from one another or even opposed to one another are not at all, that then they're, they're all necessary and that they're not by any means in conflict with one another. So that, for example, um, science depends very heavily on intuition and imagination. You only have to read, as I have done, the stories of so many of the great discoveries in science and mathematics to see that it's a combination of different ways of thinking and looking at the world, each of which is needed, and that it's, it's as false to cut um, the imagination off from science as science from the imagination and so forth. So I, I like that. I, I, I'm in the business of not um, polarizing or, or making dichotomies, but healing uh, false dichotomies. I think it's important that there should be distinctions without there having to be divisions. And, I, and in academe and in public discourse, too often things are presented as in silos that you know, never speak to one another or have different goals and different aims. In fact, the goals of all knowledge as we pursue it, and this should be what universities are doing, is a better understanding of who we are what the world is and how we relate. And that is really the foundational topic that I take, which is why it's a long book. I want to ask the question, who are we? What is the world like? And, and how do we relate? And I think that it's the loss of that that lies behind so many of our predicaments. We can easily point to the practical predicaments, the destruction of the forests, the poisoning of the seas, the uh, change of climate, the eradication of both the habitat and the ways of life of indigenous people around the globe. All these are, are catastrophes, but they have something in common. They stem from a certain way of thinking, and it's that that I wish to address as forcefully as I can, and as fairly as I can, as rationally as I can, and with as good an empirical scientific base as I can in this book. Yeah, and what you're pointing to really is a sense of synthesis, that what's required is synthesis. And I think that's really, yeah, I, I, I think that's really, really vital right now in a time where everything feels to be fragmenting more and more yes. in the culture. Yes. I mean, ultimately, of course, you know that both The Master and His Emissary and this book has a lot to say about brain structure and the difference between the hemispheres. But one of the things that I contend, it's a very basic point, is that the left hemisphere 
does tend to fragment and take things apart and compartmentalize them in a way which is inimical to understanding. And I, I, I make the point that we've fallen into a kind of mesmerized adoration of a way of thinking which evolved not to help us understand the world at all, but to help us exploit it as efficiently as possible. And those are two completely different things. And on Monday, there was a book launch uh, for your book with Perspectiva, who are publishing it. And Jonathan Rowson, the philosopher, talked about your work and said that he'd read the book and he thought that it was possible that it was on the, the level of a great work of, of, of philosophy, like a, and it could be considered in the future on the level of a Kant or a Nietzsche or one of these. I won't ask for your response to that because um, that would be unfair. But it certainly feels to me that there is a hole in the culture of the shape that your worldview or your perspective is, is trying to bring and the sense of kind of knitting things together. And it's really fascinating to me to see that your perspective is also being valued. You were on Sam Harris's podcast, for example, who I would see as kind of like the arch rationalist perspective. But your your work seems to reach across to people who have a very rationalist perspective as well as those who have a more openness to kind of spiritual perspectives or holistic perspectives. That's absolutely right. And I come back uh, to the point that I am not in any any way a foe of reason or of science. I think they are of absolutely vital importance, both of them. But they can be misunderstood. And I think that's the problem, that we have misunderstood what they are. So to go to reason first, um, I think that we, we conceive reason as the following of a chain of commands, propositions, or, or, or um, pieces of um, instruction that could be put into a computer, and they, f they lead inexorably to a certain conclusion. That is not what reason has ever me meant until now. Reason has meant the ability to, to think clearly, but that involves also an embodied understanding of the world. It's not something done in a vacuum by a brain in a vat. To use reason properly, you have to know how to, to understand what a human being is, how we think, how we live, that we are embodied animals, that we're not, and that's not a, that's not a bad thing to have to admit. That's not a, a weakness. That's actually a strength that we forget. Um, and so reason is this ability to bring together the faculties of logic with the faculties of an intuitive, implicit, embodied understanding of what it means to be alive. In other words, from experience. So in the past, people wouldn't have expected a child to have reason except in the, the simple kind that they can follow a chain of, of, of instructions. But the kind of reason that a good judge might have or, or, or that a, a wise teacher might have would come from a combination of a life well lived, experience and the ability to think clearly. And part of, the, part of thinking clearly is, because everything sounds paradoxical when one begins to look at it as it really is, it sounds paradoxical to the very narrow view that I associate with the left hemisphere, that thinking clearly also demands thinking clearly enough to see that certain things can be clarified only up to a point. If you try to clarify them any further, what you do is you destroy them, diminish them and lose them. And many of the most important things in this world are like that. Music is like that. Poetry is like that. Love is like that. Religion, spirituality are like that. Um, so what I'm doing all the time in my book is, is r r rigorous um, science. I mean, I, I really have researched and, and rely on 5,600-odd papers. In, in coming to the conclusions on the neurology, at any rate, uh, and combining that with the best kinds of philosophy, um, the best traditions in philosophy, and knowledge of physics. So it's got science, it's got reason, it's got brain 
uh, science in it, and it's got um, philosophy. So it, it's it's a mixture of these things. Once again, they're not in conflict with one another, and they need to work together. There's been a divorce between science and philosophy, which has been commented on by a number of philosophers um, in the last hundred years, um, and, and it's been a disaster for both. And maybe we should just recap the, the central thesis of Marshall's Emissary, which you should also return to in the first part of this, this book about the, the brain hemispheres. Yes. One of the, the common criticisms I hear, or um, I guess um, rejections is, oh, I thought that was debunked a long yeah. time ago. Yes, and I hoped that that uh, debunking was complete, but uh, it, it keeps coming back because people haven't actually, if they haven't read what I've written, they think they know what I'm talking about, but until they do actually read what I, I'm not saying anything like what they think um, I might be saying. And that is a rather false, um, almost entirely false, not completely false, because very few things in life fall into the 100% category, but most of the things that we used to say about the differences between the hemispheres are wrong or unhelpful. And I had to begin, uh, what is now 20 years ago, I suppose, uh, more than that, isn't it, um, by clearing that out of the way so that I could get a reception for the master and his hemisphere. I am not saying that the left hemisphere is the one that does logic and language and that the right hemisphere is the one that does emotion and pictures or whatever. Um, all, uh, all the things that are human are subserved by both hemispheres in different ways, but it's the different way that matters. So each of them, whatever they may be, whether it be language or it be reasoning or it be um, maths indeed, or, or, or um, art or, or, or philosophical judgment, they have different approaches to them which are quite coherent. And in the left hemisphere, what one can say about this is that it results in a perception of a certain kind of world through paying a certain kind of attention to it. Each of the hemispheres pays attention to the world in a different way. There are evolutionary reasons for this. Uh, every animal needs to be able to focus on the detail in order to grab it, manipulate it. The left hemisphere is the one that controls our right hand, with which most of us do the grabbing. And in most animals that we've looked at, the left hemisphere is concerned with grasping a tiny detail. For that, it needs very narrowly uh, focused, uh, targeted attention to something it's already concerned about. But it wouldn't survive if it did that for very long because it wasn't looking at the whole picture. And in that whole picture, there would be predators as well as mates and others that you needed to be aware of and look out for. So all the neural networks that we know going back 700 million years are asymmetrical. It's an interesting point because, you know, why are they asymmetrical? The world isn't asymmetrical. The world is all around us. But they are asymmetrical. And it seems that certainly the, the, my argument, and I don't know a better one, and I don't think many people have claimed that I must be wrong about this, is that we need one hemisphere that will focus on stuff to get so that we can manipulate the world, but it has nothing to do with taking in the big picture. But the other hemisphere is meanwhile helping us to understand that whole picture. So a sound bite I sometimes use is the left hemisphere helps us manipulate the world, the right hemisphere helps us understand it. And by paying different kinds of attention, different kinds of world come about. We see different things. Uh, we can all see this if we don't attend to something, we don't see it quite often. Or if we attend to it with a certain kind of clinical detachment, we see one thing. If we uh, attend to it with a kind of rapt attention, we see something different and often more beautiful. So what what we find in the world is a product of the kind of attention we bring to bear on it. That's a fairly uncontroversial remark. And it's very uncontroversial that the two hemispheres attend differently. So it follows, logically, that there will be two experiential kinds of world. What are their main differences in a handful of sentences. The left hemisphere's world shows isolated details that are familiar, known, fixed, graspable, abstracted, taken out of context, categorizable, 
and general in nature uh, and generally inanimate because the process has completely isolated them from everything else and deanimated them. The right hemisphere's vision is of things that are um, always only partly known. Uh, we can only ever be partly certain of what we're looking at and it's, it has that ability to look out for something we might be missing here. So it's a bit more skeptical. Um, it sees, as I say, things that are uh, fresh, uh, interconnected with other things, situated where they are in context. And when we take them out of the context, they change their nature completely, so that's important. Uh, flowing and changing, never fixed and graspable in that simple way. Um, and uh, effectively unique rather than simply exemplars of something in a general way, embodied rather than abstract and disembodied, and having an animate quality to them. So those are some of the most important differences. There, there are a couple of other things I would just mention. Uh, one of them doesn't sound that striking, but it's probably one of the more important differences. And that is that Part of the difference is that the right hemisphere is alive to what is as it comes about in our perception. It, 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 as it, to use a, a philosophical term, it presences to us. Whereas the left hemisphere sees a representation, which is literally something present later when it's actually no longer present. In other words, it's, it's a, a symbol, an abstraction, a map, a theory, something um, that is not the same as whatever is being mapped. So one is rich and complex and alive and hard, harder to grasp because utterly complex. The map is very, very simple by comparison. That's the left hemisphere's world. But it's virtuous that it doesn't actually see too much. On a map, you didn't want too much detail. It, it becomes useless. You, you need to simplify. So the left hemisphere sees a simplified schema of a world that is rich and complex. And the right hemisphere is in touch with that richness and that complexity. And people may be familiar with that overall model from Master and Emissary. How does your new work take that on? Well, as I mentioned, I'm really interested in, interested in this book in answering the big questions like who we are. And obviously, part of that is knowing what we can, how we can get a, a handle on what exists on ourselves, on nature, and indeed on the cosmos at, l at large. What kind of a thing is it? What can we say about it that is truer than perhaps its opposite? And so what I do is to start with looking at the way in which that, because if we, we, we're relying on our brains to bring us knowledge about the reality and they're doing it in two different ways that present two different pictures. That's an important thing to take into account at the start. We're getting two versions, if you like, to work on. So one of the first things I do is, and that's the first part of the book, is to look at the various different ways in which we get um, a handle on reality through attention, through perception, through judgments formed on perception, through um, our emotional intelligence, our uh, social intelligence, our cognitive intelligence, uh, old-fashioned IQ, creativity. These are all elements of how we come to an idea of what it is we're looking at. And apprehension, which is the ability to grasp it and use it. Now, of those, that last one is the one that the left hemisphere is hands down better at grasping and using. But everything else that leads to an understanding, it's not so good at. In fact, it is frankly deluded, left to itself. And, and I'm not using the term lightly. I actually go through. Um, many categories, as you know, of clinical delusions and hallucinations and so on. And these very preponderantly depend on damage to the right hemisphere, not to the left. So one of the things we can conclude is that if we have to, we had two alternative pictures, if you like, we know how to weight them. One of them is much more likely to be veridical, to be reliable, not to catch us out if we follow it. Whereas the other, and in this case I mean that of the left hemisphere, is liable to deceive us and to take us somewhere where um, we, we, we may get, full, get a false picture. So that what, I, what I can say is that at the end of that we can see, if you like, 
at the end of part one, we can see the signature of the left hemisphere. We know what sort of things the left hemisphere does to the world, the ways in which it simplifies it, the characteristics of its take on the world. So we now have, if you like, a way of detecting when we're contrasting two views, which one is more likely to be coming from the left hemisphere and which is more likely to be coming from the right hemisphere. I, I, I can say that categorically. And if that is the case, that is surely a remarkable step forward in the history of philosophy, because it means instead of saying, well, some people see it like this and other people see it like that, these appear to be incompatible. And for 2000 years or more, we just shrug our shoulders and go, well, there are differences of opinion. What we can say now is that we can see where they come from. We can see what their lineage is. We can see what their ancestry is in terms of the brain. And we therefore can tell which one is worthier of our trust and allegiance. Now, I'm not saying that there's one is sort of true and the other is false. That would be much too simplistic. Each of them brings forth an aspect of reality. But if you have to choose between, for example, if you're flying a, a, an aircraft blind and you have two sets of instruments, they each give you different information. And ideally, you'd like to have both kinds of information. But somebody says to you, I'm afraid we're losing power. You can only have one bank of instruments. Which one do you switch off? You switch off the one that is less important to ensuring you don't crash the plane. And so what, we, what I would say at the moment is rather paradoxically, we've switched off the bank of instruments that would help us not crash the plane. And we, we've chosen the dummy hand instead of the, the, the one that would help us um, uh, play the situation we find ourselves in. And so it's not surprising that things are going very badly wrong for us. Could you expand a bit more on that? Because the other, we, we started off by saying, why this, why now? And the other why this, why now is that you're kind of raising the alarm as well, that you feel that we're in a very dangerous situation because of the, the nature of perception that you're pointing out in your work. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and I think the, the dangers that we face are all too familiar. And I don't really need to reiterate them, and, but they are partly environmental and they're partly to do with the way in which our society now seems to work, fragmenting, becoming polarised, becoming very crude in the way in which it can discuss or talk about matters that are inevitably complex and subtle. So all kinds of things are going wrong for us at once. Um, there's more fragmentation, there's more antagonism, uh, there's less uh, compassion and humility in the way in which we, we look at the world. We see the world as a heap of resource that's just there for us to utilise in any way we like. The whole point of life is just to get some pleasure before we go because there is no meaning in, in, in life or in the cosmos at all. It's just a heap of stuff. Uh, randomly colliding and uh, that we are the products of, of, uh, of chance uh, simply and that we uh, are committed to a kind of war of all against all. These ideas that are sort of endemic in popular culture and reinforced by many of the sort of popular mouthpieces on behalf of science are not scientific, they're not rational, they're not very intelligent. They are in fact, in, you know, I would say intellectually shoddy and very poorly backed up. They, they, don't, they, they speak with the authority of science and reason without actually having that authority. And they lead people to a way of behaving which is morally and spiritually bankrupt. So one would predict that people would, what would happen is that societies would, would fragment, we'd find ourselves in all sorts of paradoxical situations where we try to achieve an outcome and achieve the exact opposite, which seems to me to be happening all around us because we don't understand how things interrelate. Um, we would be physically exhausting and destroying the planet, which we are, um, and we would be um, led to believe that because certain things, I think the most important things, um, things like like love and and um, spirituality and and um, 
the greatness of art and music and, and all these things because they can't be measured and they can't be reduced in mechanical terms to um, a, a, a materialist mechanistic explanation. They have no value or meaning. They're illusions. But that itself is an illusion. The subtitle of my book, as you know, uh, the matter with things is our brains are delusions and the unmaking of the world. So what I believe is that we are literally deluded about the nature of reality and that that is helping us unmake the world. We are dismantling a world that is intrinsically rich, complex and beautiful and instead replacing it with a heap of garbage. It's slightly like what happens in the uh, most fashionable art galleries where the idea of a work of art of something that takes skill and harmony and beauty is replaced by literally a heap of trash which is admired. And you're, in the new book, the second volume in particular, you, you focus on what is true. How do we know what is true? Um, which is a question we ask a lot on the channel. We talk about sense making, how do you make sense of the world? Um, how? Can you can you outline kind of the broader the broad structure yes. of that? Uh, yes, I mean effectively the book falls into three parts. The first is neuroscience. The second is epistemology. How do we come to know anything? And that's the bit you're asking me about. And the third part is metaphysics. So when we take our ability to discriminate and understand to looking at things, what do we find? And in part two. I take what I consider to be probably the, the four most um, likely contenders in most people's minds for ways in which we could get a handle on reality. The first two are more uncontroversial. They would be science and reason. And as I say, I'm passionate for good science and for true reason, um, but they need to be uh, just that, not um, left hemisphere parodies of science or of reason. So good science and good reason actually depend just as much on the right hemisphere as they do on the left, on being able to, to think in a sequential way to carry out certain procedures, but to see connections, to see what I call gestalten. A gestalt is a German term which means a whole shape or form which cannot be decomposed. If you take it apart, you lose it. And in fact, I believe that everything is, is really a gestalt. There are no things that can be fully understood by just taking them apart. So good science uses all of these faculties. It's not just this rather left hemisphere, bureaucratic, mindless procedure as it's often presented to school children. Um, and then uh, reason, which again, I, I've already commented, that is, is a great deal more than just a, a kind of mechanical rule following. Um, and it has its kind of contradictory qualities as well. It has its left hemisphere and its right hemisphere qualities. So, for example, reason can lead in the direction of abstraction, but it can also lead to, by necessity, to our understanding embodiment if we really want to exercise a reasonable judgment and understanding on something, we have to do it from the standpoint of an embodied human being, not from the standpoint of a, um, a, a kind of disembodied machine, uh, and, and so on and so forth. There are, there, are, there are a number of different aspects. And then I also look at intuition and imagination. And of course, um, taking intuition first, intuition has had a bad rap lately. Um, there's a sort of sense in which people have been taught to believe that our minds are faulty because you can show cleverly contrived situations in which if we use our intuition, we make a mistake. But uh, I liken this to uh, uh, an, an, the analogy of an optical illusion. I can show you an optical illusion which is so extraordinary and so convincing that you cannot believe uh, the, the reality of the situation. The one that I always come back to is a checkerboard, the checkerboard illusion, which shows two squares on, on, a, on a checkerboard, which appear to be one dark, one, one dark gray and the other you know, pale white. Uh, and they are in fact the same color, but because of the way in which the thing is set up, they, they look as though they're obviously different. 
but it can be demonstrated quite simply by drawing a line of colour between the two that they're exactly the same colour. Now, after seeing that, I don't think most people go, well, that does it. You know, from now on, I'm never going to use my eyes because they can clearly deceive me sometimes. They can, um, and intuition can. But that disguises the fact that 98% of the time, intuition is doing a very good job, not just a, a kind of folk de mieux, not too bad job, but actually a better job than we could do by being explicit. Uh, partly because being explicit, uh, of course, is enormously consuming of time and, and effort and energy, and sometimes it needs to be done, of course. There are situations where conflicts require us to, to look at them in that way. But that, in fact, intuition can take into account a, a huge number of complex factors and weigh them in different ways in order to reach a sound judgment. And in the book, I quote um, a German jurist who is uh, a jurist, who uh, I should say, who is um, the head of uh, one of the Max Planck Institutes, who says that because intuition is so much superior in being able to take into account many factors compared with the sort of, as it were, dogged, explicit reasoning, which tends to look at only one thing at a time. Um, decision makers should be encouraged as much as possible to use their intuition. So I rehabilitate it uh, to an extent and use some, I think, some really extraordinary examples that have been brought to my attention by people working in fields like um, uh, tipping horse races and uh, the TT uh, races uh, in, on the Isle of Man, this extraordinarily dangerous motorcycling event on public highways where people reach speeds of 200 miles an hour. And they have been studied uh, and the, the, the ways in which they think uh, and the ways in which they act would be completely impossible and would be utterly destroyed if they were, even for an instant, to be explicit about them. So there are many, I mean, of course, those are just entertaining examples, but they're vivid examples and they're real examples. But it applies much more generally across the board to the ways in which we look at life. And then I, I talk about imagination, which I think has got, again, this t taint in, in the modern mind of something that takes us away from the truth or away from reality. Whereas, in fact, I argue that it is our only chance of actually, for once, getting in touch with reality. The example you used of the kind of TT, the motorcycle rider, yeah. is that a little bit like um, when you look at what's going on with tennis, returning a tennis serve or returning a cricket ball, if you actually tried to do it explicitly, it would be impossible. Oh, absolutely impossible. Because you're basically, someone is making a judgment based on almost the instant that the the racket hits the ball, they're already moving to one part of the court, which if you tried to do that explicitly, you just wouldn't be able to do it. Is that what you're saying? That's right. But of course, it's not confined to, to things like sports. Um, it's how a very good chess master makes decisions. It's how a skilled surgeon makes a split second decision. It's how a pilot manages to save a plane by landing it on the Hudson River rather than crashing it. Uh, when asked afterwards how they did it, they, I don't know, I just I did the right thing. Um, <clears throat> and it's a point made by the philosopher A.N. Whitehead, who made many very fine points, and I often quote him, but <clears throat> one is that as civilizations advance, more and more of what is done is made non-explicit and unconscious and this helps us to encompass much more and that we become bogged down and second-rate mediocre decision makers as soon as we have to follow what looks like a bureaucratic procedure in coming to any decision. And there's a few fascinating hypotheses, hypotheses in the book, one of which is you talk about that... Did you say there were a few or did you say one of <laughs> this is one of them okay. um, the conversation is often around and we'll, we'll come to this in a minute sort of what is mind mm -hmm. the idea very much in the kind of the rationalist mm -hmm. materialist world there really isn't a place for mind so there's been a whole conversation around whether free will exists and mm -hmm. what what is consciousness being at the center of the the question um, the hard problem of consciousness people may be familiar with mm -hmm. but you actually reframe that by say saying Actually, we don't know what matter is. Yes. Um, 
I have a chapter, I have two chapters on matter, one called Space and Matter and the other called Matter and Consciousness. And the chapter on matter and consciousness is the length of a short book, and one day I might publish it as a separate book, because those who've read it have said it's a, have been, you know, kind enough to say it's a, it's a, it's a very good treatment of that notoriously difficult topic. Um, but I think that our assumption, uh, which is on the face of it a very unlikely assumption, that com that a matter that has no consciousness can somehow secrete consciousness. As soon as you say it, you sort of begin to think, hmm, this is a clever conjuring trick. Um, the, that whole idea is based on the idea that one moves from the simpler towards the more complex. So we understand matter. So let's try and extract consciousness from that. But as physicists constantly reinforce, Matter is no simpler than consciousness, and also, in a sense, is interdependent on with consciousness. So, uh, the, the idea that we could explain consciousness through matter uh, turns out not to be a good intuition in itself, and it's not possible. Nobody has given us the faintest encouragement of exactly how consciousness comes out of matter. There's, people talk about emergence, but emergence is just one of those, you know, and now a miracle happens uh, phrases. It's like I tap the hat and a rabbit comes out. It emerges from the hat, but how? Nobody has the slightest idea how this emergence happens. It's a black boxing technique. Um, and they, they sort of say things like um, complexity of neurons, uh, the, the sheer complexity of neurons gives rise to consciousness. Well, first of all, nobody has satisfactorily explained how complexity on its own should give rise to consciousness, which in any case we don't, we don't have a very clear understanding of it from the outside. We have the best possible knowledge of consciousness from the inside, nothing that we know better than consciousness, but what is it? We, we, very hard to say. But why it should arise out of sheer complexity of interconnections is not stated. But also, it, it simply doesn't, in the sense that, for example, in the brain, um, the part of the brain that we normally think of as the bit that serves our, our waking consciousness, and we're, we're right that, it, that it, that is largely the case, is the cerebrum, uh, the, the, the bigger part of the brain, the new brain, uh, but there is also a very ancient, uh, much smaller part of the brain, the cerebellum, uh, that's situated at the back of the, of the skull. Uh, and this uh, cerebellum contains four times as many neurons as the cerebrum, and yet cannot, contain, uh, cannot sustain consciousness on its own. Uh, given consciousness, it contributes, but a cerebellum cannot give us consciousness. And so people might say, well, yes, okay, there may be, you know, 100 billion neurons there, but perhaps they're not interconnected enough. But this, again, I'm afraid is wrong, that some of the most sophisticated and massively complexly interconnected cells are Purkinje cells, which only exist in the cerebellum. So altogether, none of the... I, I, my, my, my argument in, in that chapter follows a number of steps, and I, I can't really give all those steps now. But I, I gradually dispose of the idea that we need these various things for consciousness, and suggest that indeed consciousness exists in, in plant life, uh, in, in, in the most simple kinds of cellular life, uh, and may indeed exist uh, beyond that. In, in fact, I'm a, as now quite a number of mainstream philosophers are, uh, panpsychism or panexperientialism, which is the idea that consciousness is an irreducible ontological primary in the cosmos. It's not something that ever emerged from anything else, but is one of the building blocks of the cosmos. So the interiority that we have there is an interiority in all matter, is that? Yes, yeah. that, that matter and consciousness uh, are seamless, although they obviously have different qualities. So once again, it's a, a, an instance of a distinction without there being a sundering or 
or, or ultimate separation. And one of the ways I <clears throat> think of um, matter is uh, as a phase of consciousness. And when I say phase, I don't mean a temporal phase, one that comes later or earlier. I mean a phase in the sense that chemists speak of water having different phases. One is the liquid phase in which it is translucent, it flows, uh, you know, it can pass over your hand, um, and you can see through it, all these things. Uh, and then there is ice, which is opaque, hard, um, immobile, unless it's broken up and, and shifted, uh, and is so hard that it can split your head open. So it has completely different qualities. But if you said, what is, which of them is water? I'd have to say, well, they're actually both water. It's just that one is a different manifestation of water in a different way, under different circumstances. And I, I say that matter is consciousness in a different manifestation, in a different phase. And what it offers is resistance. So matter is something that resists my will. That's what I mean by matter, that you know I can think myself anywhere I like, but I can't actually put my hand through the table. It, it, it says no. Uh, and it also causes things to persist. A world without matter, things would be fleeting all the time. But it causes a certain congealing, rather like ice, a sort of slowing down and solidifying, as well as resistance, again like ice, to the processes of consciousness. And I say that that resistance is highly creative. One of the things I argue in the book is that nothing can be created without resistance which sounds paradoxical, but many of the things that I have to say sound superficially paradoxical, but I explain why they are necessary. And in the book, I include a chapter, as you know, on the coincidence of opposites, how in fact, uh, again, very simplistic idea that a thing and its opposite are at the two ends of a linear pole. It's not the case, and it seemed to me actually all my life, uh, it was a very early intuition in my teens, that if you push something far enough, you don't get further and further away from its opposite, you start to come back to its opposite. So all that needs to be taken into account. Yeah, I'd love to come back to that in a second. But you mentioned um, panpsychism. Mm. There has been a sort of general move towards that, or a rehabilitation yes, kind of yes. perspective. But I'm told that you come to panentheism rather than panpsychism? Well, they're not at odds with one another. So they're not, uh, they're, they're different, but not uh, contrary. Um, my beliefs, or my, my, it can only be a hypothesis about whatever it is we mean by the sacred or the divine, uh, are expounded in the last substantive chapter of the book called The Sense of the Sacred, which is even longer than the chapter on matter and consciousness and caused me more grief than anything else I've ever written because as soon as you start saying anything about this realm, you falsify it. And that's a well-known um, truth in many wisdom traditions. The Tao that can be named is not the real Tao. And St. Augustine said about God, si comprehendis non est Deus. If you understand God, then it's not God that you've understood. And actually, it's rather like Richard Feynman saying, if you understand particle physics, you haven't understood particle physics. So there are certain things that simply are resistant to normal language, normal um, exposition of an argument, but don't, for that reason, not exist. Particles have many complex, apparently paradoxical qualities, but there's something there that we are referring to when we talk about a wave or a particle. Equally, it's a mistake to dismiss something that can't be pinned down easily in language and that when you do try to put it into language, you then misspeak. And, and, and in fact, you, you produce an idol, uh, I-D-O-L, um, in other words, a false god. Um, and that's why in many traditions, the name of God is not to be spoken because it is actually a distraction and makes you think that you've understood God, you've got God, you've grasped God, because that's what we use language, well, I've got it now. Whereas it's always a process of coming towards an understanding, not 
a thing. That, of course, is another theme of my book, that all is in process and relationship, that there are no things as such. Um, as long as you qualify the idea of a thing sufficiently, um, I, I can rehabilitate the idea of a thing. But I did initially think of calling the book There Are No Things. But I was um, aware that I could be mistaken for uh, a certain kind of slightly facile postmodernist who just thinks that um, everything's made up by us. And I didn't, I, I profoundly disagree with that, so I didn't want to be um, mixed up with that. So I changed the title to um, The Matter with Things. And there is a, a very kind of Taoist sense to, to this perspective. Is that is a big influence on you? It's a huge influence on me. When I first came across Taoism in my late teens and early 20s, uh, it, it affected me so much that um, I almost dropped everything just before I decided to study medicine. I almost decided to study Chinese. Because when I was writing my very first book, Against Criticism, I was talking to a colleague at my college, All Souls, uh, a lovely sinologist and scholar, David Hawkes, uh, about my work. And I was saying, I'm finding it very difficult to explain why the implicit is more important and more powerful than the explicit. It doesn't seem logical to the Western mind. I'm finding it very difficult to explain why things change when they're taken out of context. I'm finding it very difficult to explain why true knowledge has to be embodied, not disembodied. And he said, yes, I know the problem is that in English there aren't words for this, but in Chinese there are. And so I thought, I must, and of course I don't know any Chinese, so the end of that story is sad, but <laughs> but Taoism has lived with me. Um, and uh, Buddhism, I think, is a very important uh, influence, uh, particularly Zen Buddhism, uh, and they have a lot in common, of course. And obviously, the image of Taoism, the, the, the black and the white, the circle, mm. that seems to be very um, resonant to what you were talking about with opposites. Yes, what's so lovely about that symbol, often called the um, yin-yang symbol, is the, the, the Taijitu, um, is that it shows these two apparently opposed things, the, the white curved, semi-curved shape and the, the black one that fits into it. There are two things about it that are beautiful. One is that together they make a perfect circle. And the other is that in the yin there is a little bit of yang, and in the yang there is a little bit of yin, so that no absolute division is being made. And could you talk a bit more about opposites as you see them? Um, because I want to also come into polarization and whether there are kind of insights from your work that could be applied to things like the polarization we're seeing, the culture war, that kind of that kind of thing. Well, there certainly are. Um, what to say about opposites in general? Niels Bohr said that it is that the opposite of every profound truth is also a profound truth. And I, I think that's absolutely right. What he wasn't saying is that superficial truths and their opposites are both true. I mean, either I had milk in my coffee this morning or I didn't. You know, it's as simple as that. But the deeper the truth, the more, unless you are mistaking things, you need to accommodate its opposite. And most of the hard problems that we need to solve in the way in which we respond to both one another and the world depend on deep truths, the, the big ones, uh, that are complex in nature, intrinsically. Uh, I, I, I have a picture in the book, uh, which is one that um, viewers and listeners may know, uh, by M.C. Escher. Uh, it, it's, its real name is Circle Limit 4, but it's not a very good description of it. I, I think it's better known as angels and devils, and it's a complete circle in which every space is occupied by a figure of a devil or an angel, and they interlock in such a way, they're black and white, rather like the Taijutu symbol, that you can see that the whole space is occupied by devils and angels that interlock. And one saying, I don't know if it's a general saying, but that I have, is every angel has his devil. And one of the things that we neglect is what Jung would have called the dark side of every 
too. So the, the, the things that we think must be good in a rather simple-minded way conceal many harms. And I mean, to be very blunt, um, the worst atrocities in the history of mankind have been committed by people with a theory about how to make life better and how to make the world a better place. Uh, we've seen this happen repeatedly in the last couple of hundred years. So that is one aspect, but a much deeper one is, I begin that chapter with, uh, I think, an incredibly beautiful and rich Iroquois myth about creation, about two brothers that have the qualities of the left and right hemisphere. It is absolutely extraordinary. Um, it was brought to my attention by a, an anthropologist uh, to whom I'm very grateful, Stefano Feit. Um, and he said it, the, the parallels are uncanny, and they, they are. And I haven't got time, unfortunately, to unpack it, but it's a treat there for anyone reading the book. But effectively, these two forces, one of them is the overarching better and more all-seeing force, which whose name is he who grasps the sky with both hands, uh, interestingly. And his brother, Flint, who doesn't see the whole, but is intent on capturing things with his arrow and with pinning them down with speech. And that they both are needed in a way. And the bad brother can do good work as long as he does it entirely under the supervision of the good brother. So the good brother mustn't absent himself too far from the bad brother, otherwise real damage will happen. But he mustn't get too close either because he needs to remain uncontaminated by, by this other way of thinking. Now this again is very like the relationship between the right and the left hemispheres. We need them both, that they do in a sense opposite things, but they're both required and they're both compatible as long as one of them, the left hemisphere, is subservient to the needs of the right hemisphere. In the world we're in now, we've reversed this order. And there are many myths around the world, as I've discovered, in Chinese literature and Japanese literature, but also in, as I say, Native American traditions and um, circumpolar traditions of this relationship between two powers. One of them should have the overarching vision, but is being usurped by the one that doesn't. It's as though people intuitively cognize the structure of their own psyche. So that's why, partly why I think it's very important. But there is also, perhaps to bring things down to a more everyday level, there's a phenomenon called hormesis, which is a term from chemistry. And it's um, best known to most people um, through the widely, I think, familiar fact that many medicines are poisons uh, if given at uh, a sufficiently high dose. Uh, but tiny traces of them can be enormously beneficial. Um, something like, uh, there's a drug called digoxin used very widely by people with heart failure. It's from Digitalis, the fox club. If you eat Digitalis leaves, you die. But a little bit of this is actually life-giving. And there are many others. Arsenic, actually, is another example. A little bit is quite beneficial, but more is not. And in connection with that, there's an interesting story uh, from a... Um, a biological, technological experiment called Biosphere 2, which was an enclosed environment in which could be controlled and protected to see how species behaved, plants and animals and birds, when they were in an, in, in an enclosed space. And the scientists were mystified by the fact that in this apparently ideal environment, trees rarely, if ever, achieved maturity before they fell over. And it turned out that what they needed was the stress of winds blowing on them. And this caused the formation of what's called stress wood, which is the strength of a tree. And it caused it also to put down deep roots. And it's an image which actually, interestingly, Nietzsche anticipated in exactly those terms 200 years earlier, um, or, or 100 and something years earlier. Um, and it's a good example of how as Paracelsus says, everything is a poison, all depends on the dose. Now, in the world in which we live, we've completely lost sight of that. We think that some things are simply good, some things are simply bad. And of course, that, I mean, a child of three or four could tell you that that can't be right. Uh, 
because they experience already that some things they like can make them sick <laughs> and some things that they don't like actually turn out to be rather good for, for them. So the very, very simple-minded way in which all public discourse takes place today, that this is right and this is what you must think and this is wrong and you must not even discuss it, well, it, it, it's the death of of any kind of intellectual, moral, or spiritual life. It's just, you know, do we want to commit suicide? This is how to do it. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely something that you see, particularly on social media, like yeah. that one comment and someone's kind of beyond the pale or yes. like this sort of the sense of kind of cancellation. And um, are there any other ways that you would apply your thinking to it? Because I understand as well that you... You you believe that a certain amount of tension is necessary. I do. That um, that act So, do you think that that is is the case in sort of? Do you think polarization itself is a bad thing, or do you think that some of it will be is necessary? Well, polarization in the sense of conceiving of two things as so distinct that they they have no relationship is fundamentally false. Heraclitus, my favorite philosopher, ancient Greek philosopher, has this image of the string of a lyre or the string of a bow. And he says, they do not understand how a thing harmonizes in opposition to itself. And what he's talking about is that the strength of the bow to fire an arrow, the strength of the string of the lyre to give forth a note, comes from the pulling in two directions. But importantly, these are connected. If they weren't, then there would be no point in the, in the image at all. And they do need to be pulled. If you just let it go slack, then there is no power in it. So we need to accommodate both positions all the time and see how they balance one another, see how they harmonize. What at one moment is good in one and what at one moment is good in another. I say that specifically because nothing is good all the time and in all contexts either. Um, again, Whitehead, there are no whole truths, there are only half truths. It's treating half truths as whole truths that plays the devil. Again, we have no concepts of, well, this is a partial truth. Or as again, Whitehead said, the, the interesting point is not, is this true or is it not true? But in which context is it true? And in which context is it not true? All this much more subtle thinking, contextual thinking, nuanced thinking, the understanding of a mass of complexly interrelated phenomena where you can't just fill it out the bits you like and not have the rest. Uh, I, this I find very disturbing. But I can point to many, many paradoxes in, in our society where we set out to do one thing and achieve another. You know, we, we, we believe so importantly that we're vulnerable to infection, that we sanitize everything to the point where we immediately fall ill as soon as we contact a, a germ of any kind. We, we protect our children because we think we want to, you know, um, preserve them. And by doing that, we make them incapable of um, benefiting from or even enjoying um, risk of any kind. Uh, Overprotection makes people weak. Um, we, we, we criminalize drugs in, in, in this forlorn idea that we can rid society of drugs. We, we certainly don't do that, but we create a very fertile field for, for organized crime and for petty crime. So, you know, I could go on and on, but you know, we, we, we try to sort of make the humanities um, return on investment, but by doing that, we make them certainly incapable of returning anything and a waste of, of resources. We misunderstand, we misunderstand the nature of what we're dealing with, that things are complexly interconnected, that systems are, have many complexly recurring loops in them, and that they're not linear in this way that bureaucratic organizations imagine things to be. They see a goal and they say, we take these logical steps and usually we end up in the wrong place. We end up with something we didn't intend. We, we go for freedom and we end up actually tyrannizing. Um, we've seen this happen, unfortunately, in a number of societies uh, in, in a disastrous way uh, in living memory. And I believe we're now acquiescing in this in our own culture. 
Yeah, I mean, you, you mentioned the word nuance, which mm. is something that many of us who sort of been watching the public conversation have sort of said, nuance seems to be lost more and more. Like there, there's less and less space for nuance. There's less and less nuanced conversations. Mm. And even the nuanced conversations that maybe were sort of erupting or were emerging like a few years ago seem to have kind of often become more polarized and become yes. more polarized. I think the, the pandemic had a huge impact. Yeah. You see all of these kind of conversations around, like the temperature seems to be raised more yes. and more. Do you think that's related to to the, 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 the situation that you're laying out in your work? Well, yes, I do, because I think the, another unfortunate reality is that the more you suppress and repress something, the more power you give it and eventually it will erupt in a most unpleasant way. And then you say, you see, that's what we were fighting against. But actually, partly you caused the reaction by being so extreme. So in politics, if you stigmatize your opponents as stupid, unimaginative, you know, foolish, immoral, um, and don't give them the benefit of, of the doubt, then they will become embittered and more extreme in their views. What always is important is dialogue. It's so basic. Anyone who's ever had a relationship with anybody <clears throat> will know that dialogue is essential to the continuing health of that relationship. And that when things get worse, what you don't do is say, I'm not talking. You say, we must talk. And talk in a civilized way. Again, it's not so much the what as the how of all human activities that seems to me to matter. And is this a left brain phenomenon where we increasingly see the other one as evil, as wrong, as um, unable, to be di unable to have that dialogue with? I suppose so. I mean, one of the definite tendencies of the left hemisphere is black and white thinking. It thinks, you know, in oppositional terms, either this or that. And we see that increasingly in our culture and in our interactions with machines, which um, is coming on so rapidly that almost year by year, one can feel the encroachment into every attempt to achieve any outcome. You're forced to do it through the internet using a computer algorithm, which will only allow very simple alternatives. But in life, there, there are no simple alternatives. It's yes, but, what if, and if the circumstances are like this, then what, and so on. And this is the loss of reason. A reasonable person in the past was able to say, yes, well, the rule says this, I see that. But under the circumstances, I totally understand that actually the right thing to do here is that. That is increasingly hard to find. And people are frightened. So people are frightened of stepping away from the algorithm they've been told to follow, the machine they've been told to imitate. We are telling people to imitate machines. We are schooling them to do so. We're disciplining them. And if they stop imitating a machine, now this is something surely both very important and very mad. You've sort of sketched out a way that you think the world is, is that we're in crisis and things are likely to get worse if we're not kind of aware of these dynamics. Yes. Um, obviously, there's people like Steven Pinker and other optimists who are just basically saying, no, I think the world is getting better. We're just not appreciating the ways that it's getting better. Um, do you think that they're wrong? I do, yes, yes. I, 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 have, I have a lot of respect for Steven Pinker. Um, particularly for his moral courage and standing up for science. Um, I disagree with him about a number of things. I, I've, I've gone into print uh, in disagreeing with his view that basically science answers all our questions. I think actually he, he's not as simple-minded as that. He's a very clever man, but he tends to express things in such terms and himself went into print to say that and I took issue with it. Uh, because science can't conceivably answer many very important questions, perhaps some of the most important questions, which is not in any way to disrespect science. It's to disrespect science and misunderstand it, to claim it can do things it can't do. But um, I, I do think that certainly his optimism is, is, well, I don't share it. I think it's based on mistaken reasoning. Uh, 
I mean, a simple example is the idea that people are being brought out of poverty all the time, when what a lot of time has, is happening is that people who have ancient ways of life which do not, aren't enmeshed with the modern capitalist economy, have no wage, as it were, if you try to account for them in a spreadsheet. But they only become truly poor when you uproot them from where they've always lived and their way of life and take them into the cities, put them in a slum and pay them a pittance. You now say before they were paid nothing, now they're paid a pittance. This is marvellous. This is progress. It's just one example of how you can misuse um, the appearances of a situation because you're not thinking broadly enough. You're, you're, you're thinking only in a very narrow term. And when, you, uh, and I, as I say, I mean, <clears throat> I, or perhaps I didn't say uh, when I was giving my little sketch of some of the things that distinguish the right and left hemispheres. One of the most interesting ones is a pathological optimism in the left hemisphere, and I really do mean pathological. So bad that it is completely in denial when things are very, very seriously wrong. The right hemisphere doesn't do this. The right hemisphere is, if anything, a little bit overcautious, um, but it, it's much closer to reality. It's the reality tester, basically. The right hemisphere is a bullshit detector. The left hemisphere is full of it. <laughs> and part of that is its belief that there's nothing wrong with anything it can be doing. And I, I, I said this before, but a very striking example for many people is that <clears throat> after, a, say, a left hemisphere, uh, stroke and you've got a, a paralyzed right arm, the person knows perfectly well they've got a paralyzed right arm. After a right hemisphere stroke and they've got a paralyzed left arm, they will deny completely that they have a paralyzed arm. They, and, and if asked to move it, they will say, there, I just moved it, and nothing moved. Um, and if you bring the hand round in front of them and say, now move that, they say, oh, that's not my arm, that belongs to that man in the next bed. So it is really, really extreme. It is delusional, a delusional optimism. And it also goes with the fact that can be demonstrated by in inquiring of one hemisphere at a time about its estimation of its own qualities and abilities, that the left hemisphere has a very high opinion of itself and the right hemisphere has a much more modest opinion of itself, which goes in, hand in hand with the fact that the right hemisphere is, as I said earlier, more intelligent, not much just emotionally and socially more intelligent, but more cognitively intelligent than the left hemisphere. And we know that relatively unintelligent people think they know everything, and that people who are highly intelligent are aware of how little they know. Mm. Dunning-Kruger. Dunning-Kruger effect, exactly. Yeah. And do you tackle the the big G question in this, the God question in the, the book? The reason I didn't use it in the title of that chapter, The Sense of the Sacred, is that I think the word God is, and, and what do you say, do I tackle the God word or the G word? The word is the problem. And... So I think the first thing to do is to get rid of all the unfortunate misconceptions that have accreted around this word and instead lead people from things that we've already discussed to do with the structure and nature of the cosmos, space and time, consciousness and matter, values and purpose, which I believe are real, not involving an engineering God. I'm absolutely against the idea of an engineering God, um, which is the left hemisphere's idea of a God. After all, its idea is we can make everything. It's Meccano. We put it together with bits and we make it work. We set it in motion. That is the perfect exaltation of the left hemisphere's aspiration to control everything. And it's in exact antithesis to the nature of what I think the divine is, which is not this controlling, mechanistic whatever, but is nonetheless a force, a something, is perhaps as close as one can get. One can say certain things about it, that it is relational in nature, that it is not just an inert thing but it is relational. 
and and as a result of that, I believe that the whole of the cosmos and everything is relational. I argue that relations are actually primary to the things that are related. They are more basic. It's not that we first have things and then we work out how they're related. But we first have a universe of relationships and out of that web, certain crossing points in the web stand forward to our attention and we focus on those. We call them a thing, which is another reason why I've called the book The Matter with Things. So, yes, I do tackle it in a sort of manner of speaking. As I say, it caused me more grief than anything else I wrote because of two contradictory things, which I think are probably to be expected by anyone who's thought a lot about spiritual matters, that the subject is profoundly important and yet almost impossible to speak about. And that in speaking about it, you, you inevitably betray it but in not speaking about it, you also betray it because you pretend it doesn't exist and is not important. So I, of course, failed, as one must in this attempt, but I am proud to have tried and failed. And I hope that my attempt and my failure will encourage some people to be less glib in their dismissal of such an idea. In fact, I hope that through the course of the book, people will be led from this, I think, very simple-minded reductionist materialist way of thinking about everything to a view that <clears throat> there is a great deal more here than we can easily comprehend or perhaps ever comprehend, and that it is important to honour that and be aware of it, and that if we do, we help to bring more of something rather good into being. In other words, we carry a kind of moral responsibility for whatever it is that goes on in the in the cosmos, because we are not just in a passive way part of this creative cosmos, have been created, but also we are part of the process of creating what comes. So, in a way, far from our lives being pointless and worthless and meaningless, there is, if you like, a, a moral weight to our existence, which is to do our best to attend openly and without judgment to what is, to see what is there, to respond to it, and to encourage it more into being. And in doing so, we also fulfill ourselves more. Creation is also, this has been said by a number of people in different fields, but, and I quote some of them in the book, that, that creation is always also self-creation. And I believe that this creative force in the cosmos, whatever one likes to call it, is creative of something other, but is also creating itself in that process. And this other of which we are part, although that other is never completely separate, I'm not putting a big divide, but it is also coming into being through this process. Again, A.N. Whitehead conceived what he called the world and what he called God, as in a process of endless co-creation. And you also mentioned um, subatomic physics, quantum theory before, and I got echoes of that in what you were talking about just just then, the sense of things being in flux. And um, how would you, what did you make of that? How would you link those two things together, the sense of the sacred and then the quantum? The quantum theory realm? Well, I'm very pleased to say that quantum physicists would bear out my belief that relationships are prior to relata. In fact, I quote a couple of physicists who have said pretty much exactly that, that therefore what exists is relational in nature. We also know that from quantum entanglement that things are more complexly and extensively interconnected than in our common Newtonian way of thinking we take them to be. And I think I'm a great follower of something called quantum field theory, which is a development out of quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is a misnomer, really, because it should be called non-quantum non-mechanics. But anyway, that's for another time. But um, quantum field theory, which posits that although fields can take up the qualities of a particle at a certain moment because of the interaction between elements which quite possibly include the observer's consciousness, 
what fundamentally exists is continuity and there is discontinuity within continuity. In other words, continuity finally trumps discontinuity. So this is another important <laughs> theme of my work, which is that we need a force for union, but we also need a force for division. But importantly, they need to be unified. So at the meta level, union trumps division but division still needs to be there, and it's not been lost, it's been taken up, or as Hegel would have said, aufgehoben, into a greater union. And Goethe himself, who I think was another of the great wise minds of all time, said that this is the business of creation, the business of nature is division and union. He called them like the systole and diastole, the two beats of the heart, that you cannot have one without the other, and that they mutually fulfill one another. And what do you think it means for our culture, sort of socio-economic structure, to act on the, the view that you're putting forward in, in the book? Well, I know you're not asking me to describe an economic policy, and uh, <laughs> I'm certainly incapable of doing so. I don't have the training um, or the inclination. But um, what I think... Uh, is this. Again, Whitehead said, as we think we live. Now, there's something wrong with the way we're living. And I think it depends on this false way of thinking, which is dependent on the left hemisphere. So what I don't want to do is narrow this down to, so we should do this, that, and the other, because that actually would be, in a way, a perfect expression of the left hemisphere's point of view. This situation is fine as long as we just put in the following, um, what are those things called, uh, fixes, you know, uh, this, this, will, this will sort it out. What we need to do is to completely change the way we think of ourselves in the world. And I, I've said before, but I stand by it, that even if we could reverse the dreadful destruction we're wreaking on nature and, and the dissolution of our society, which we seem to be encouraging day by day, um, we, and we could therefore survive a bit longer, we could stop the rainforest from being destroyed, there would be no point in it. It would not matter, to use that word in, a, in a, another way. It would not matter that we continue to exist. If you remain the same narrow, narcissistic, profoundly dissatisfied, greedy, atomistic individuals that we have turned ourselves recently into, unless we can rediscover the value in itself of certain things, the beauty, the complexity of the natural world, not as a resource that helps us improve the economy or do something like that, but for itself alone. Unless we can recover that, there is no, no point in our continuing our existence. So it's primary. What, what I'm talking about is more important than anything. It's not to say that we don't need act actively to be getting on with doing whatever we can to stop things falling apart. And we need actions that can be determined by, by policy makers to do things about um, improving our treatment of what's called the environment. I hate the word, I think we should call it nature. Environment suggests it's something around you that isn't you, whereas in fact we come out of nature and return to nature. But th 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 those things are, are very important. But once again, they are the work of the emissary. The work of the master is to re-envision what we are, what the world is, and how we relate to it. So, I don't know what you want me to get closer to, but what are you hinting at that you would like me to address? Um, I guess to turn the, the philosophy into something that feels more actionable. What do you think is the actionable part of what you're talking about? Well, I think it boils down, doesn't it, that or question? Like a very to, left question. Well, <laughs> that's a little unfair, but I mean, it's a very natural question. It's the it's the question: What do we do? What do we do? We're in a crisis. Tell me, what do we do? I can't tell anybody what we should do because that's again at the local level of 
we could teach more of this, which is certainly true. Um, I mean, what I always say, and it is probably very frustrating of me to say it, but it is nonetheless true, is that it is a huge mistake in psychiatry to tell people what to do. And I, I, I thought of writing a book once called Our Society on the Couch, meaning <clears throat> I think we're pathological and explaining what's pathological about it. But when things are awry in this way, telling people you should do this never works because unless they already can see why they should do it, in which case they've probably already done it, it won't, it won't click with them. They'll think, oh, I can't do that. That'll just completely derail my life. I don't do that. And it's only later when they've seen why it is that they're suffering because they're thinking in a certain way, doing certain things, that they then say, you know, I think I ought to do so and so. And you sort of, when you're very naive and, and, and sort of clever and young as a psychiatrist, you sort of know what people need to do and you tell them and it never works. And it, later you have to learn <clears throat> to take them to a place where they can say for themselves, I need to do that, then they do it. The whole point of my having squandered 10 years of my life writing this book <clears throat> was to be able to take people, as it were, by the hand and say, look at this. Um, because when you see this, you will start to think differently about many things. And as we think we live, we then start to live differently. The trouble with we should do this, a rule or something like that, is that it is like putting a sticking plaster on a cancer. It's cosmetic. We do that, but we're still doing it for the wrong reasons. It's like Einstein's famous uh, saying that we can't get out of the situation we've created with the same thinking that got us into it. So although it's frustrating not to come up with six bullet points before breakfast, I really feel like resisting it because there's something bigger at stake which is a whole vision of the world and of us and if I don't convey that then I failed. So perhaps the question is what is the journey that you hope people will go on with this book? Well what I'm hoping is that I know it will be difficult for many people to read it through from beginning to end because it's a long book. Nonetheless it is as it were a seamless progress but I would encourage people to dip into it and to come back to different parts of it. And I hope that if they do that and get enough enjoyment out of it, they'll end up probably reading it all in the end anyway. But what I want to do is to take them, it sounds like a cliche on a journey, I know, but it's, it's a better idea than arguing with them, although I do reason, is to take people to a place where they see a different viewpoint which will be one which will not be, which will both be new and not alien. So I think that a lot of people intuitively know that certain things are the case, but they have been taught by a strange and misguided culture that these ideas are childish or wrong and should be disattended to. And I think that we've we've lost an enormous amount that's of great value, of the greatest value through doing this and made ourselves unhappy. So I want to take people to a place where they recognize again the validity of these things. And one of the things that has been said about the Master's Emissary time and time again and was said to me last night by Philip Pullman um, when we were having a public conversation uh, was that when he first read The Master and His Emissary, he felt that things that he had deeply known but had not had the language for or been able to articulate were clearly argued for and explained and that he therefore reconnected, as it were, with his birthright from which he felt he'd been estranged. And that's what I wish for people, that they will make contact again with the vision of a world that is not a heap of pointless fragments that is not chaotic, ugly, and without meaning, which is not just um, one in which we are the playthings of chance and embroiled in a war of all against all, but one that is beautiful, 
intrinsically complex, rich, conscious and responsive and is a gift in which we should stand in awe rather than in the position of master and controller of all. Ian, thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much indeed, David. It's been great to be here again. Thank you for watching all the way to the end. If you'd like to join conversations like this, check out our digital campfire. You get access to a load of member-only films. You can watch live, ask questions, come to our book club, our wisdom gym sessions, and our regular monthly meetups where we share what's going on behind the scenes, and you can also connect with other Rebel Wisdom members. What's more, you can also get discounts on our courses like Sensemaking 101. Check out the link below, and we'd love to see you soon.